Greetings. My name is Morgan Harloff. I am an integrated cardiothoracic surgery resident at Brigham and Women's Hospital, affiliated with Harvard Medical School. On behalf of my esteemed colleagues, thank you for this opportunity to present our step-by-step -step guide to transeptal valve and valve transcatheter mitral valve replacement. These are our disclosures. Surgical mitral valve replacement remains the standard of care for patients with severe mitral valve disease when repair is not feasible. Bioprosthetic valves have increased in popularity in recent years, from 32% in the year 2000 to 63% in 2009. This is due in large part to the fact that they do not require the lifelong anticoagulation that mechanical valves necessitate. However, they are prone to structural valve degeneration. When structural valve degeneration occurs, Repeat mitral valve replacement, a high-risk operation associated with 9% mortality and major complications, may be required. The success of transcatheter aortic valve replacement over the last decade has spurred interest in the production of similar percutaneous options for the management of severe mitral valve disease. Unlike the aortic annulus associated with severe aortic valve stenosis, the native mitral annulus is typically not sufficiently calcified to serve as an anchoring point for transcatheter mitral valve replacement. Valve and valve transcatheter mitral valve replacement, on the other hand, is a therapeutic option that has emerged as a safe and reproducible alternative for patients with a degenerated bioprosthesis at high risk for repeat surgical mitral valve replacement. The ring of the degenerated bioprosthesis serves as a reliable anchoring point for a transcatheter valve, thus avoiding one of the major limitations associated with transcatheter mitral valve replacement in the native mitral annulus. In fact, valve and valve transcatheter mitral valve replacement was approved for high-risk patients by the FDA in June 2017. Initial experiences were performed primarily via a transapical approach through a left mini thoracotomy as seen here on screen left, due to comfort with transapical TAVR. Transapical access also offers direct access and coaxial device alignment. However, this comes at the expense to trauma to the left ventricle. With advancements in TMVR technology, such as the development of smaller delivery catheters with high flexure capabilities, the transeptal approach via the femoral vein, as seen here on screen right, has emerged as the preferred option. This technique offers the advantages of a totally percutaneous approach, avoids the need to enter the thoracic cavity or pericardial space, has a lower risk of vascular injury, and provides superior outcomes compared to a transapical approach. Patient selection is critical to conducting successful transeptal valve and valve TMVR. Patients with a degenerated mitral valve bioprosthesis at high risk for repeat open heart surgery should be evaluated by the structural heart team, comprised of a cardiac surgeon and an interventional cardiologist, for consideration of valve and valve TMVR. Several important factors must be taken into consideration when evaluating a patient for valve and valve TMVR because they may prohibit the procedure. Absolute contraindications include the presence of endocarditis, dehiscence of the mitral bioprosthesis, thrombus formation at the atrial septum, and an interrupted inferior vena cava. Relative contraindications include a history of previous atrial septal repair or valve surgery via a transeptal approach, severe patient prosthesis mismatch, thrombus within the right or left atrium, or severe paravalvular leak. Those with a small left ventricular outflow tract should be approached with caution because they are at increased risk for left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, a feared and potentially life-threatening complication associated with TMVR. Preoperative transesophageal echocardiography should be employed to identify the mechanism for bioprosthetic failure, whether it be mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation. It should also be used to assess the anatomy of the interatrial septum. 
If the septum cannot be visualized on transesophageal echo, transeptal valve and valve transcatheter mitral valve replacement is not feasible. Preoperative CT with TMVR protocol is mandatory to assess the potential for iatrogenic LVOT obstruction, one of the most devastating complications that can occur with transeptal TMVR. Literature states that those with LVOT obstruction carry a procedural mortality rate that exceeds 30%. Simulation with a virtual transcatheter valve in the mitral annulus, as seen here, can predict the hypothetical LVOT area, also commonly referred to as the neo-LVOT, after valve and valve TMVR. If the projected neo-LVOT area is less than or equal to 1.7 centimeters squared, there is a very high chance for post-procedural LVOT obstruction. If present, strategies to reduce the risk of LVOT obstruction should be considered to prevent this problem. CT can also be used to measure the internal diameter of the old bioprosthesis as a reference size for the transcatheter valve to be inserted. Although rare, CT can also identify an interrupted inferior vena cava, a phenomenon that would render transeptal valve and valve TMVR infeasible. The following sequence of slides demonstrates a step-by-step -step guide to transeptal valve and valve transcatheter mitral valve replacement. The patient is brought to the cath lab and placed in the supine position. A radial arterial line is placed for continuous hemodynamic monitoring. After induction of general anesthesia, a transesophageal echo probe is inserted for pre- and post-procedural interrogation of the mitral valve. Both groins are prepped and the patient is draped in standard surgical fashion. The provider stands side by side at the patient's right side with the fluoroscopy arm and monitors directly opposite them. The bilateral common femoral veins are identified by ultrasound. As you can see in the image on the left, the vein is differentiated from the artery because it is compressible while the artery is pulsatile. The bilateral common femoral veins are accessed with a micropuncture wire sheath under ultrasound guidance using the Seldinger technique. As the micropuncture wire is advanced under fluoroscopic guidance, it is important to note that the wire should remain to the right of the patient's spine. This is to confirm placement into the vein rather than the artery. A six front sheath, as seen on screen left, is inserted into the bilateral femoral veins. The right femoral vein is then pre-closed with a per-closed proglide device, seen on screen right, for suture-mediated closure of the venotomy that will be used for insertion of the large bore sheath. 5,000 units of heparin are administered intravenously. A mullen sheath, as seen on the left, is then advanced into the right atrium via the right femoral vein under fluoroscopy. Next, as you can see on screen left, a bayless radiofrequency needle is advanced through the mullen sheath and directed toward the fossa ovalis by transesophageal echo in the bicaval and short axis views, as well as fluoroscopy. If there are pre-existing pacemaker leads in the heart, it is important to identify those on transesophageal echo before advancing the transeptal needle into the right atrium. Transeptal access with a mid-posterior bias in the fossa ovalis, as seen in the upper right, is helpful in establishing a favorable trajectory for the mitral valve. In this particular procedure, you want to use the four-chamber view, as seen in the bottom right, to ensure a transeptal puncture height of 2.5 to 4 centimeters above the annular plane of the mitral valve. Finally, the atrial septum is punctured with radiofrequency transmitted through the transeptal needle. The transeptal needle is withdrawn and an in -away wire is inserted into the left atrium. Then, the agilla sheath, a steerable introducer, is further advanced into the left atrium 
over the inner wire. Entry into the left atrium can be confirmed in a number of different ways. First, as seen on screen left, dye can be injected through the agilla sheath, allowing bubbles to be observed in the left atrium on transesophageal echo. Second, as seen on screen right, left atrial pressures can be transduced on the monitor. Third, an arterial blood gas sample can be drawn from the left atrium to confirm appropriate partial pressure of oxygen. The patient is systemically heparinized. After confirming therapeutic ACT of 250 to 350 seconds, the agilla sheath is steered toward the left ventricular apex. A standard J wire is passed into the left ventricle. A pigtail catheter is then advanced into the left ventricle over the J wire. Finally, a temporary transvenous pacemaker is inserted through the left femoral venous sheath, floated up to the heart, and anchored into the trabeculae of the right ventricle. Rapid pacing is briefly performed to confirm capture of the pacemaker. With standard wire exchange techniques, a safari wire is carefully advanced through the pigtail catheter into the left ventricular apex. The pigtail catheter is withdrawn. Over the safari wire, a 14 French Edwards E sheath is inserted into the right femoral vein and the interatrial septum is dilated with a 14 millimeter Armada balloon. Balloon septostomy is important because the Sapien 3 delivery system does not have a tapered tip. Therefore, balloon septostomy is required to advance the delivery system across the atrial septum and into the left ventricle. The balloon is withdrawn and an Edward Sapien III transcatheter heart valve system is mounted on the delivery catheter with the skirt towards the handle. It is important to note that this is opposite the direction in which it would be loaded for TAVR. The Edward Sapien III transcatheter heart valve system is advanced into the inferior vena cava and the entire sheath is rotated 180 degrees clockwise. This maneuver allows the flexing mechanism of the device to be angled towards screen right, opposite the leftward curve to be expected in TAVR. Then, the device is advanced across the atrial septum and into the mitral position. As noted in the various valve and valve images on the screen, the Sapien 3 needs to be 10% higher than the atrial end of the fluoroscopic portion of the bioprosthetic stent. After satisfactory positioning, the valve is deployed under rapid ventricular pacing. The valve is typically not perfectly coaxial to the annular plane, but autocorrects during valve inflation. Inflation must be slow, and the operator closer to the valve must be prepared to adjust the position during valve inflation. Following valve deployment, transesophageal echocardiogram is used to assess valve position, motion of the leaflets, transmitral gradients, presence of paravalvular leaks, and the gradient across the left ventricular outflow tract. As previously mentioned, valve and valve transcatheter mitral valve replacement was approved by the Food and Drug Administration in 2017 for high-risk patients with a degenerated mitral valve prosthesis. A recent study compared 1,529 transcatheter mitral valve and valve cases using the Edward Sapien III valve captured from the Society of Thoracic Surgeons and American College of Cardiology TVT registry between June 2015 and July 2019. During the study period, transeptal access was used in 86.7% of cases compared to transapical access in 13.3%. Transapical access required more frequent conversion to open surgery compared to transeptal, 2.5% versus 0.7%. Likewise, transapical access was associated with longer length of stay at six days versus two days, as well as 30-day cardiovascular death, 5.1% versus 2.1%. Conversely, Transeptal access was associated with lower all-cause mortality at one year compared to transapical, 15.8% versus 21.7%. All p-values were significant. In conclusion, advancements in TMVR technologies 
and preference for a less invasive approach have allowed the application of transeptal valve and valve TMVR to grow rapidly among patients with a degenerated mitral bioprosthesis at high or prohibitive surgical risk. The outcomes have shown this to be a safe and feasible procedure compared to transapical access, but further studies with long-term outcomes are needed. Thank you for listening to this keynote lecture on transeptal valve and valve transcatheter mitral valve replacement.